How's it going, everyone? Uh, this is Matt, Comic Order 410, trying to make a second video here. I think I've learned it's probably better to shoot sideways, so we'll see. Sorry again, still learning and it might be shaky. But I just love comics. Always have. I collect them, I read them, I follow characters, artists, writers. Just buy them because I like the covers as pieces of art sometimes. So, uh, just going to share some more of my stuff here. And the problem with my collection is they're not in any type of order. I have like 60, 70 boxes. And I, I got to really get a big room that I can dedicate just to comics and put them all in order. But So there's no really rhyme or reason to how they're organized. And right here I just got a box of magazines. I'm going to share a few of those. So first is a really sharp copy of Dark Horse's Hard Boiled Number 1 by Frank Miller and Jeff Darrow. I highly recommend this. is a great read. The visuals are amazing because Jeff Darrow is, he, he, he's an American, but he draws kind of almost like a, a Japanese manga influence style. And he loves to draw all kinds of details and little bits and pieces of machinery and glass and everything. He's done some Deadpool covers recently. And those of you who play video games will know uh, Jeff Darrow did the art on um what was it sorry the fallout new vegas if you bought the collector's edition it came with a hardcover graphic novel and uh jeff dara drew the fallout new vegas graphic novel but hard boiled's a good read i recommend picking up the graphic novel it's not that expensive uh that copy cgc worthy as is this i think this is number five because it has no number on the cover but this is savage tales Featuring Conan, one of the great Marvel 70s black and white magazines that they made more aimed towards adults uh, with more violence and adult storylines because they could avoid the Comics Code Authority that way. So I uh, believe this is number five. It's a gorgeous uh, Neil Adams cover. And again, that copy is probably CGC worthy. This one really isn't. It's probably about a fine very fine maybe but uh, I got this for 55 bucks years back it's savage sort of Conan number one and it's a really awesome painted Boris Vallejo cover of oops sorry of Conan and Sonya fighting skeleton warriors so I'm a big fan of Conan have tons of Conan stuff I'm trying to put together a complete run and I have all the Dark Horse stuff they've ever made and most of the key Marvel stuff, so working on that. Okay. Next we have some more 70s Marvel mags. Again, they were done, it says Curtis magazines, but they were Marvel. I think Curtis is just who did all their 70s mags for them. But this is the Tomb of Dracula number one, the magazine number one. With a painted Bob Larkin cover there. A couple side inserts. I think that's Frank Langella playing Dracula at the top. But, so that would definitely make it the 70s. But that's a pretty sharp copy. This, unfortunately, is not that sharp of a copy. It's probably about a 5. But this is Deadly Hands of Kung Fu number 1. Gorgeous. Gorgeous Neil Adams Bruce Lee cover. Just smashing. This is might even be better because, again, it's a Neil Adams cover, but it has Bruce Lee and Black Belt Jones knocking somebody's teeth out. Don't get much better than that. Deadly Hands was uh, one of my favorite, probably my favorite Marvel magazine as a kid in the early 80s. And, uh, oops. And I read this one right here, number 10 as a child and fell in love with it because I was getting into kung fu movies and uh, now I'm trying to put together a run as I am with many things but here's number nine again a really nice copy don't know who painted this cover Shang Chi master of kung fu over here this is the one I read as a kid number 10 that's an iron fist cover Sorry about the quality here. The lighting's not good right now. Maybe I'll redo this video, but this is my favorite cover of all the Deadly Hands. And this is, let me scoot over here and see if I can't get rid of this glare or something. This is number 14. 
And this is Neil Adams' tribute cover to Bruce Lee after he died. It's hard to find high grade because it's a big black and white magazine nobody took care of, and it has a black border. This copy has two minor chips over here. I don't know if you can see them. I zoomed in a bit too far. There's one, but it's still really, really sharp, and that is just a badass cover. Remembering the dragon. more 70s Marvel stuff. Much like I'm a big fan of Conan, I'm a huge Punisher fan. I've been collecting all his stuff. And uh, first we got Tales of the Zombie number one. Awesome Boris Vallejo painted cover. That, that magazine's probably about a six, but that is a great cover. Love horror books too. They just don't make them like they used to. Look at that. Look at that price tag, Marvel, 75 cents with the zombie head reading the book. Kicks ass. And here's the Punisher stuff. These are the two black and white Punisher mags Marvel did in the 70s. This is Marvel preview number two, the more valuable of the two, and the, in my case, the better condition of the two. And this is uh, the first telling of the origin of Punisher. And it's a badass gray Morrow cover where he's just gunning these fools down, painted awesome and that's the stuff that attracted me to these magazines they wouldn't do that in the normal books where he fought spidey here's the other one this is marvel super action new number i believe it's number one not sure who painted this cover uh, this copy's not in as good a shape probably about a six but uh glad to have them both as a punisher fan okay. up next These are nice. These are nice. And you know what? I'm going to throw you up there too. Going back to the 50s with this one. This is a nice one to have too. But these are uh, the Spectacular Spider Man magazines, number one and two. They only did two. And these predated the Spectacular Spider Man comic by a long time. They actually came out early on in the Amazing's run there from the late 60s. This one has a 35 cent cover price. Getting an awful lot of glare here. There we go. 35 cents. And it's a beautiful genre me to paint a cover. Both of them were the only did these two. My number two is not nearly in as good a shape as the first one. But look at that cover, man. Genre me to painting the Goblin Spider-Man fighting at his prime. Beautiful. I love that cover. And this is something awesome. I bought a really nice collection off of a friend. His father had his collection from when he was a kid, and his father passed away. And, and my good buddy uh, thought of me and knew I collected comics. He said, hey, instead of selling them to some dealer for half a book value, why don't we sell them to my friend for half a book value? Because they go to a home where they're appreciated instead of being resold. And this was among them. And this is from the 50s. This is Superman Three Dimensional or Three Dimension Adventures. Number one, um, the glasses aren't there. The spine's really rough, but that is just something awesome to have. It's not in that bad a shape. I'd give it maybe a five. Pushing, yeah, uh, four or five, because the glasses are missing too. But that's just some. That's just something cool to have. And now we're getting into these were also in the collection that I bought off my friends. That was his father's. And these I'm really glad to have. This is Mad Magazine number 24. And as you can see, it says first issue, the new Mad. This new magazine is vital for you to read. Inside you'll find an extremely important message from the editors. This... Uh, is the very first magazine sized mad this is when it turned into actual mad magazine it was a comic sized by ec originally and after seduction and innocent <laughs> seduction of the innocent came out sorry for that mush mouth after that came out by dr frederick wortham 
They had a Senate hearing on violence and bad influences in comics, and they established the Comics Code Authority, and MAD went to magazine size to avoid the regulation, uh, which is what Marvel copied in the 70s. But this is pretty valuable. It's not a perfect copy by any means, but it's pretty decent, and it's pretty cool to have. Uh, this is number 27, three issues later. Big jam cover, a lot of detail in there. There we go, thank for the focus. Not sure who did this cover. Jack Davis, I can't tell. There's an awful lot of detail in there. Here's number 28, the very next issue, the spring issue. These are very early. They say on there, July of 56. These are from 55 and 56, these, these mads. And, uh, let me take these down gently. Couple more old mads here. Oh, 29. 31. And 33. I, I think, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think 31, maybe it was 30, but if not, it's 31. But this may be the first mad cover with Alfred E. Newman. Uh, if not, it's the second, but that's number 31. Number 29. Most of these are in pretty good shape for Zoldas there. A lot of them have these, you know, these datings. Um, some historians say it's not damaging the book because all, there were no comic specialty shops back then, and a lot of retailers did that, put some sort of dating on there so they could rotate the books. And they, some say it's a part of the history and it doesn't affect the value. Some say it does deface it and affect the value. It depends on who you talk to, I guess. But a lot of these books have that. But other than that, they're in really good shape. There's number 33, another spring issue with Alfred E. Newman. You know, when they're talking about Ernie Kovacs and Al Jasbo Collins, you know those books are old. <laughs> Don't even know who they are. So there you go. But we got a couple more. A couple more Mads. More, I guess Ernie Kovacs must be an artist on Mad, and I'm ashamed I don't know that, but who knows. But here's the fifth anniversary cover. Norman Mingo. Kind of jam cover, a bunch of celebrities from 1957 this is number 40 Andy Griffith show I guess so they start parroting stuff finally and number 41 from pretty cool cover but yeah you can see Alfred E. Newman starting to appear on a lot of the covers by that time so those were really neat to have those thrown in uh, with that collection. I got a lot of nice stuff. I didn't, I didn't get it cheap, but I got a lot of nice stuff from those guys. Bunch of EC books and other things I'll show you later. Bunch of Disney and, and Looney Tune, Dells and Woody Woodpecker. All kinds of funny animal books from the 50s. So, But that'll be for another time. Uh, here's some eerie books and not in proper order, but that's okay. This is a repro of an original creepy cover that Frank Frazetta did, and this is the Werewolf vs. Dracula, and that's a legendary painting. Uh, this is, you know, unfortunately the second time it was used in a Warren magazine, but still pretty kick-ass cover. This here is a later one from 82, and um, it's when Vampirella started coming in. Vampirella and Frankenstein. Pretty cool cover. Had the other creepy and eerie characters, some of them fighting. It was a, like you said, an all-star classic. Cool, kind of cartoony cover, but shades of realism. Who was that? Fastener? Not really sure. Familiar with them, but good cover. This is creepy, number 36. Not the best copy, but this is the first issue... Richard Corbin did, and he is one of my absolute favorite artists. A lot of people don't like him, but I love him. He, he takes, he, he walks that line between cartoony and realistic so well, and his drawings are awesome. I really like him, and this is the first issue he did, and I like that. A couple more issues of the 
creepy here. This is 44. And again, this is a pretty famous cover, and I'm ashamed to say, I think it was Corbin again. But I'm not sure, but I believe that is Richard. It doesn't say Corb on it anywhere, but I believe that is him. I could be wrong. But there's creepy number 44. And this is another Frank Frazetta classic. And I should be kicking myself in the behind for not knowing the title of this painting. But uh, that is a nice Frank Frazetta painting. have a really good art book of uh, Frank Frazetta's called Icon and I highly recommend it. He's one of the best painters uh, of all time, much less comic artist. So I, I re recommend people check that out. A couple more I got here. Some uh, graphic novels. I've, when I was a kid in the 80s, oh god, don't fall. When I was a kid in the 80s, these were a big deal. These graphic novels started coming out, and there were no ads, larger, better paper, better art, better stock, and it, it blew my mind. The first one I got was uh, Alien Legion, which I'll show you in a minute, but these are these are some good ones. This is a DC one that came out later, but this is uh, a painted Jack Kirby cover. There's dark side in the cockpit if it'll clear up the focus for me. But this is the Hunger Dogs, and this is a CGC worthy copy. This is really sharp, and uh, this is where Dark Side kills a bunch of people. <laughs> he, go, he goes out and just wrecks shop. And uh, Jack Kirby wrote and wrote it and did the art, and it's one of his later works, and it's hard to find. And I think this goes for like 50 or 70 bucks in near mint, but. Uh, Got, got an unread copy of it here, and I'm happy about that. This is the first Marvel graphic novel, I believe. And it's The Death of Captain Marvel by Jim Starling. And that's, um... This is really an important story in Marvel history, and, and often referenced and looked back to. Dreadstar, this is the third Marvel graphic novel. Again, a Jim Starling. And this one he painted, and the art in this is phenomenal sci-fi kind of story yeah because these graphic novels were so fun when I was a kid I'm going back and getting a lot of ones I didn't have because some most of them aren't too expensive to track down but this is Alien Legion I have a complete run of the comic Frank Sirocco did the art. I don't know what happened to him, but that's a, you know, he was good, I thought. And that's Alien Legion. Again, a really sharp copy. I got a bunch of these uh, Marvel graphic novels, about four or five off a guy who gave me his unread copies. I, you know, I didn't get them um, any kind of deal on them, but they're sharp. Swords of the Swashbucklers, that's a Jackson Gleis one that was supposed to launch a series that never went anywhere. This one was mine as a kid and is read heavily. And uh, it's Revenge of the Living Monolith. But it was an awesome story. Uh, Dave Michelin and Mark Silvestri drew it. And, you know, it's Spidey, Mr. Fantastic, She Hulk, and Johnny Storm. Because She Hulk was a part of the Fantastic Four at that time, and Thor. And, man, the quality of lighting or something in here is not doing well. But we'll see. Maybe I'll have to redo this one. We'll see. Alright. This is Emperor Doom. This is a really, really cool story. Where Doctor Doom takes the Purple Man and builds a machine that amplifies his power, so he can just influence everyone to do whatever he wants. And the Avengers, and I believe West Coast Avengers, had to stop him. That was a good read. And like I said, I love Conan. These are the two Marvel graphic novels from the '80s, and they're both in sharp condition. This is the Witch Queen, Witch Queen of Acheron, and uh, Gary Gary Quap is. I guess that's what I'm saying his name right. He drew it. He was a pretty famous Conan artist. And uh, this one, 
goes for a decent amount of money. You know, you see copies going for 40 and 50 bucks of this because this one, uh, Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway wrote the script for Conan the Destroyer. It was originally called Conan the Thief. And it went through so many revisions that it didn't really reflect the Conan character because they wanted to make a PG movie. Although I liked the movie because I saw it as a kid on HBO all the time. Uh, I, I like to read this version too, which is Roy Thomas and Jerry Conway's original script made into a graphic novel, uh, so you can read it. And this one is, uh, by Conan fans anyway, this is one of the ones they're looking for. It's not as easy to find as the, the one that's older. So, but they're both good reads if you like Conan. Get in here. Oh yeah, these are these are two of the unread copies I got off this kid. Okay, the Futurians is not, but that's uh that's Dave Cockrum's attempt. This is uh, Marvel graphic novel number nine. It's Dave Cockrum's attempt to um, make another team after the X Men, and it didn't do so well. I'm a big fan of Sergio Aragonese, his work on Mad and Gru, and this is a sharp, sharp, unread copy of the Death of Gru Marvel graphic novel. Super sharp. Same thing with this Spider-Man hooky. This thing is crisp, and it's done by the master of horror, Bernie Wrightson, and that that graphic novel kicks ass. If, no, if you haven't read it and you like Spider-Man, do yourself a favor. Um, for now... That looks like it's about it. Uh, hopefully I'll be bringing more videos of uh, some of my other books soon. Thanks for watching and take care.